Good evening. We're going to read a little John Keats. Because John Keats before bed will put you to sleep in a good way. So this one is Hyperion, John Keats, book one. Deep in the shady sadness of a veil, far sunken from the healthy breath of morn, far from the fiery noon and eve's one star, sat gray-haired Saturn, quiet as a stone, still as the silence round about his lair, forest on forest about his head like cloud on cloud. No stir of air was there, not so much life as on a summer's day, robs not one light seed from the feathered grass, but where the dead leaf fell. There did it rest. A stream went voiceless by, still deadened more by reason of his fallen divinity, spreading a shade. The naiad mid her reeds pressed her cold finger closer to her lips. Among the margin sand, large footmarks went by. Along the margin sand, large footmarks went, no further than to where his feet had strayed and slept there since. Upon the sodden ground, his old right hand lay nerveless, listless, dead, unsceptered, and his realmless eyes were closed, while his bowered head seemed listening to the earth, his ancient mother, for some comfort yet. It seemed no force could wake him from this place. And there came one who with a kindred hand touched his wide shoulders after bending low with reverence, though to one who knew it not. She was a goddess of the infant world, by her in stature the tall Amazon had stood a... By her in stature the tall Amazon had stood a pygmy's height. She would have taken Achilles by the hair and bent his neck, or with a finger stayed Ixion's wheel. Her face was large as that of Memphian. Her face was large as that of Memphian Sphinx. Her face was large as that of Memphian Sphinx, pedestaled haply in a palace court, when sages looked to Egypt for their lore. But oh, how unlike marble was that face! How beautiful, if sorrow had not made sorrow more beautiful than beauty's self. There was a listening fear in her regard, as if calamity had but begun, as if the vanward clouds of evil days had spent their malice, and the sullen rear was with its stored thunder laboring up. One hand she pressed upon that aching spot where beats the human heart, as if just there, though an immortal, she felt cruel pain. The other upon Saturn's bended neck she laid, and to the level of his ear leaning with parted lips, some were and to the level of his ear leaning with parted lips, some words she spake in solemn tenor and deep organ tone, some mourning words, which in our feeble which in our feeble tongue would come in these like accents. Oh, how frail to that large utterance of the early gods. Saturn, look up. Though wherefore, poor old king, I have no comfort for thee, no, not one. I cannot say, oh, wherefore sleepest thou? For heaven is parted from thee and the earth. Knows thee not, thus afflicted for a god, an ocean too, with all its solemn noise, as from thy as from thy scepter passed, and all the air is emptied of thine and all the air is emptied of thine hoary majesty, thy thunder, conscious of the new command, rumbles reluctant o'er our fallen house, and thy sharp lightning in unpractised hands scorches and burns our once serene domain. O aching time, O moments big as years, all as ye pass well. All as ye pass swell out the monstrous truth, and press it so upon our weary griefs that unbelief has not a space to breathe. Saturn, sleep on. O oh, thoughtless, why did I thus violate thy slumbrous solitude? Why should I ope thy melancholy eyes? 
Saturn, sleep on, while at thy feet I weep. As when upon a tranced summer night those green-robed senators of mighty woods, tall oaks, branch charmed by the branch charmed by the earnest stars dream and so dream all night without a stir save from one gradual solitary gust which comes upon the silence and dies off as if the ebbing air had but one wave so came these words and went so came these words and went and while in tears she touched her fair large forehead to the ground just where her falling hair might be outspread, a soft and silken mat for Saturn's feet. One moon with alter, one moon with alteration slow had shed her silver seasons four upon the night, and still these two were postured, motionless, like natural sculpture in cathedral cavern, the frozen god still calchant on the earth, and the sad goddess weeping at his feet, until at length, Old Saturn lifted up his faded eyes and until at length old Saturn lifted up his faded eyes and saw his kingdom gone and all the gloom and sorrow of the place and that fair kneeling goddess and then spake as with a palsied tongue and while his beard shook horrid with such aspen malady O oh, tender spouse of gold Hyperion Via I feel, I feel the air I see thy face. Look up and let me see our doom in it. Look up and tell me if this feeble shape is Saturn's. Tell me if thou hearst the voice of Saturn. Tell me if this wrinkling brow, naked and bare of its great diadem, peers like the front of Saturn. Who had power to make me desolate? Whence came the strength? How was it nurtured? to such bursting forth while fate seemed strangled in my nervous grasp. But it is so, and I am smothered up and buried from all godlike exercise of influence benign on planets pale, of admonitions to the winds and seas, of peaceful sway above man's harvesting and all those acts which deity supreme doth ease its heart of love in. I am gone away from my own bosom. I have left my strong identity, my real self, somewhere between the throne, and where I sit here on this spot of earth. Search, Thea, search. Open thine eyes, Etern, Eterna. Open thine eyes, Eterna, and sphere them round upon all space, star-spaced and lorn of light, space space regioned with life air and barren void, spaces of fire and all the yawn of hell. Search, Thea, search, and tell me if thou seest a certain shape or shadow making way with wings or chariot fierce to repossess a heaven he lost erewhile. It must, it must be of ripe progress. Saturn must be king. Yes, there must be a golden victory. There must be gods thrown down and trumpets blown of triumphs calm and hymns of festival and hymns of festival upon the gold clouds metropolitan voices of soft proclaim and silver stir of strings and hollow shells and there shall be beautiful things made new for the surprise of the sky children i will give command thea Thea, Thea, where is Saturn? This passion lifted him upon his feet and made his hands to struggle in the air, his druid locks to shake and ooze with sweat, his eyes to fever out, his voice to cease. He stood and heard not Thea's sobbing deep a little time, and then again he snatched utterance thus, But cannot I create? Cannot I form? Cannot I fashion forth another world? another universe to overbear and crumble this to naught? Where is another chaos? Where? That word found way into Olympus and made quake the rebel three. Thea was startled up, and in her bearing was a sort of hope, as thus she quick-voiced spake, yet full of awe. 
this cheers our fallen house. Come to our friends, O Saturn, come away and give them heart. I know the covert, for thence came I hither. Thus brief, then with beseeching eyes she went with backward footing through the shade a space he followed. <clears throat> Then with beseeching eyes she went with backward footing through the shade a space. He followed, and she turned to lead the way through aged boughs that yielded like the mist which eagles cleave up mounting from their nest. Meanwhile in other realms big tears were shed, more sorrow like to this, and such like woe, too huge for mortal tongue or pen of scribe. The titan's fierce self hid or prison bound groan. The tear, the titan's fierce self hid or prison bound groaned for the old allegiance once more, and listened in sharp pain for Saturn's voice. But one of the whole mammoth brood still kept his sovereignty and rule and majesty. Blazing Hyperion in Blazing Hyperion on his orbed fire still sat, still snuffed the incense, teeming up from man to the sun's god, yet unsecure. For as among us mortals, omens drear fright and perplex, so also shuddered he, not at dog's howl or gloom bird's hated screech or the familiar visiting of one upon the first toll of his passing bell, or prophesyings of the midnight lamp, but horrors portioned to a giant nerve oft made Hyperion ache. Oft made Hyperion ache, his palace bright bastioned with pyramids of glowing gold, and touched with shade of bronze, and touched with shade of bronzed obelisks, glared a blood red through all its thousand courts, arches and domes and fiery galleries, and all its curtains of aurorian clouds flushed eagerly, while sometimes eagles' wings, unseen before by gods or wandering men, darkened the place, and neighing steeds were heard, not heard before by gods or wandering men. Also, when he would taste the spicy wreaths of incense breathed aloft from sacred hills, instead of sweets, his ample palate took savor of poisonous brass and metal sick. And so, when harbored in the sleepy west after the full completion of fair day, for rest divine upon exalted couch, and slumber in the arms of melody, <clears throat> and slumber in the arms of melody, he paced away the pleasant hours of ease, with stride colossal, on from hall to hall, while far within each aisle and deep recess, his winged minions in close clusters stood, amazed and full of fear, like anxious men who on wild plains gather in painting, who on wild plains gather in panting troops. When earthquakes jar their battlements and towers, even now, while Saturn, roused from icy trance, went step for step with Thea through the woods, Hyperion, leaving twilight in the rear, came slope upon the threshold of the west. Then, as he was wont, his palace door flew ope in smoothest silence, save what solemn tubes, blown by the serious zephyrs, gave of sweet and wandering clouds slow-breathed melodies and like a rose in vermeil tint and shape, in fragrance soft and coolness to the eye, that inlet to severe magnificence stood full-blown for the god to enter in. He entered, but he entered full of wrath. His flaming robes streamed out upon his heels and gave a roar as if of earthly fire that scared away the meek ethereal hours and made their dove wings tremble. On he flared from stately nave to nave, from vault to vault, though through bowers of fragment and in wreathed light and diamond-paved lustrous long arcades until he reached the great main cupola. There standing fierce beneath, he stamped his foot and from the basements deep to the high towers jarred his own golden region. And before the quavering thunder thereupon had ceased, his voice leaped out 
despite of godlike curb to this result. O dreams of day and night, O monstrous forms, O effigies of pain, O specters busy in a cold, cold gloom, O lank-eared phantoms of black weeded pools, why do I know you? Why have I seen ye? Why is my eternescence thus distraught to see and to behold these horrors new? Saturn has fallen. Am I too to fall? Am I to leave this haven of my rest, this cradle of my glory, this soft clime, this calm luxuriance of blissful light, these crystalline pavilions and pure fanes of all my lucent empire? It is left deserted, void. It is left deserted, void, nor any haunt of mine. The blaze, the splendor, and the symmetry I cannot see, but darkness, death, and darkness. Even here into my center of repose, even here into my center of repose, the shady visions come to domineer, insult, and blind, and stifle up my pomp. Fall, no by Tellus and her briny robes. Over the fiery frontier of my realms I will advance a terrible right arm, shall scare that infant thunderer, rebel Jove, and bid old Saturn take his throne again. He spake and ceased, the while a heavier th the while a heavier threat held struggle with his throat, but came not forth. For as in theaters of crowded men, Hubab increases more when they shout. Hubbub increases more when they call out, Hush! So at Hyperion's words the phantoms pale bestirred themselves, thrice horrible and cold, and from the mirrored level where they stood a mist arose, as from a scummy marsh. At this, through all his bulk and agony, crept gradual from the feet unto the crown, like a lithe serpent, vast and muscular, making a slow way with head and neck convulsed from overstrained might. Released he fled to the eastern gates, and full six dewy hours before the dawn in season dew should blush, he breathed fierce breath against the sleepy portals, cleared them of heavy vapors, burst them wide suddenly on ocean's chilly burst them wide suddenly on the ocean's chilly streams the planet or the planet orb of fire whereon he rode each day from east to east whereon he rode each day from east to west the heavens though spun round in sable con spun round in sable con <laughs> spun round in sable curtaining of clouds not therefore veiled quite blindfold and hid but was n but ever and anon the glancing spheres circles and arcs and broad belting colour glowed through and wrought upon the muffling dark sweep shaped lightnings from the nadir deep up to the zenith hieroglyphics old which sages and keen-eyed astrologers then living in the earth with laboring thought won from the gaze of many centuries now lost, save what we find on remnants huge of stone or marble swart, their imports gone, their wisdom long since fled, two wings this orb possessed for glory, two fair argent wings ever exalted at the gods' approach, and now from forth the gloom their plumes immense rose one by one, till all outspreaded were, while still the dazzling globe maintained eclipse, waiting for Hyperion's command. Fain would he have commanded, fain took throne and bid the day begin, if but for change he might not. <clears throat> if but for change he might not. Oh, though a primeval god, the sacred seasons might not be disturbed. Therefore the operations of the dawn stayed in their birth, even as here it is told. Those silver wings expanded sisterly, eagle. Those silver wings expanded sisterly, eager to sail their orb. The porches wide opened upon the dusk dimness. The porches wide opened upon the dusk dimness of night, 
and, br and the bright titan frenzied with new woes, unused to bend by hard compulsion, bent his spirit to the sorrow of the time. And all along, a dismal rack of clouds upon the boundaries. And all along, a dismal rack of clouds upon the boundaries of day and night, he stretched himself in grief and radiance faint. There, as he lay, the heaven with its stars looked down on him with pity, and the voice of Colas from the universal space thus whispered low and solemn in his ear, O oh, brightest of my children, dear earth-born and sky-engendered, son of mysteries all unrevealed even to the powers which met at thy creating, at whose joys and palpitations sweet and pleasures soft, I, Colas, wonder how they came and whence, and at the fruit, therefore, what shapes they be, distinct, invisible, symbols divine, manifestations of that beauteous life diffused unseen throughout eternal space. Of these new formed art thou, O brightest child, of these thy brethren and the goddesses. There is sad feud among ye, and rebellion of son against his sire. I saw him fall, I saw my firstborn tumbled from his throne. To me his arms were spread, to me his voice found way from forth the thunders round his head. Pale walks I. Pale walks I, and in vapors hid my face. Art thou too near much doom? Vague fear there is, for I have seen my sons most unlike gods. Divine you were created, and divine in sad demeanor, solemn, undisturbed, unruffled, like high gods ye lived and ruled. Now I behold you, now I behold you fear, hope. Now I behold in you fear, hope, and wrath, actions of rage and passion, even as I see them on the mortal world beneath in men who die. This is the grief, O oh son, sad sign of ruin, solid, sad sign of ruin, sudden dismay and fall, Yet do thou strive, as thou art capable, as thou canst move up, as thou canst move about an evident God, and canst oppose to each malignant hour ethereal presence. I am but a voice. My life is but the life of winds and tides. No more than winds and tides can I prevail, but thou canst. Be thou therefore in the van of circumstance. Yea, seize the arrow's barb before the tense string murmur to the earth, for there thou wilt find Saturn and his woes. Meantime, I will keep watch on thy bright sun, and of thy seasons be a careful nurse, ere half this region whisperer had come down. Hyperion arose, and on the stars lifted his curved lids, and kept them wide until it ceased. And still he kept them wide, and still they were the same bright, patient stars. Then with a slow incline of his broad, then with a slow incline of his broad breast, like to a diver in the pearly seas, forward he stooped over the airy shore, and plunged, all noiseless, into the deep night. That is uh, the end of book one of Hyperion by John Keats. Let's see how long these other two are. So it's not 10. Ten pages. Almost halfway done. <clears throat> I guess we'll uh I guess we'll crack on. Book two.
Just at the self-same beat of time's wide wings, Hyperion slid into the rustled air, and Saturn gained with Thea that sad place where Cybele and the bruised titans mourned. It was a din where no insulting light could glimmer on their tears, where their own groans they felt but heard not, for the solid roar of thunderous waterfalls and torrents hoarse pouring a constant bulk, uncertain where, crag jutting forth to crag and rocks that seemed ever as if just rising from a sleep, forehead to forehead, held their monstrous horns, and thus in thousand hugest fantasies made a fit roofing to this nest of woe. Instead of thrones, hard flint, they sat upon couches of rugged stone and slaty ridge stubborn with iron. All were not assembled, some chained in torture and some wandering, Coes, the Gyges, and Berelius, Briarius, and Briarius, Typhon, and Dolor, and Porphyrion, Porphyrion, and Porphyrion, with many more, the brawniest in assault, were pent in regions of laborious breath. Dungeoned in opaque element to keep their clenched teeth still clenched, and all their limbs locked up like veins of metal, cramped and screwed, without emotion save of their big hearts heaving in pain and horribly convulsed with sanguine, fervorous, boiling gurge of pulse. Nemesine was straying in the world. Far from her moon had Phoebe wandered, and many else were free to roam abroad, and for the main here found they covert. But for the main here found the covert drear, scarce images of life, one here, one there, lay vast and edgeways, like a dismal cirque of druid stones upon a forlorn moor, when the chill rain begins at shut of eve in dull November and their chance. In dull November in their chancel vault, the heaven itself is blinded throughout the night. Each one kept shroud, nor to his neighbors gave or word or look or action of despair. Creus was one. His ponderous iron mace lay by him, and a shattered rib of rock told of his rage, ere he thus sat, ere he thus sank and pined. Iapetus, another, in his grasp, a serpent's plashy neck, its barbed tongue squeezed from the gorge, and all its uncurled length dead, and because the creature could not spit its poison in the eyes of conquering Jove, Next, Cotus, prone he lay, chin uppermost, as though in pain, for still upon the flint he ground severed, for still upon the flint he ground severe his skull, with open mouth and eyes at horrid working. Nearest him, Asia, born of most enormous calf, born of most enormous calf, who cost her mother, who cost her mother tell us keener pangs, though feminine than any of her sons, though feminine than any of her sons, more thought than woe was in her dusky face, for she was prophesying of her glory, and in her wide imagination stood palm-shaded temples and high rival fanes. By Oxus, by Oxus, or in Ganges' sacred isles, even as hope upon her anchor leans, so lent she, not so fair, upon a tusk shed from the broadest of her elephants. Above her on a crag uneasy, above her on a crag's uneasy shelve, upon his elbow raised, upon his elbow raised, all prostrate else, shadowed in clay, in Celadus. Shadowed in Celadus once tame and mild as grazing ox unworried in the meads, now tiger-passioned, lion-thoughted, wroth, he meditated, plotted, 
and even now was hurling mountains in that second war, not long delayed, that scared the younger gods to hide themselves in forms of beast and bird. Not far hence, Atlas, and beside him prone, Forcus, the sire of Gorgons, neighbored close Oceanus, neighbored close Oceanus and Tethys, in whose hap sobbed Clymene among her tangled hair. In midst of all lay Themis at the feet of Ops. At the feet of Ops, the queen all clouded round from sight, no shape distinguishable more than when thick night confounds the pine tops with the clouds, and many else whose names may not be told. For when the muses' wings are airward spread, who shall delay their flight? And she must chaunt of Saturn and his guide, who now had climbed with damp and slippery footing from a depth more horrid still. Above a somber cliff their heads appeared, and up their stature grew till on the level height of their steps found ease. Then Thea spread her... <clears throat> Then Thea spread abroad her trembling arms upon the precinct of this nest of pain, and sidelong fixed her eye on Saturn's face. There saw she direst strife, the supreme god at war with all the frailty of grief, of rage, of fear, anxiety, revenge, remorse, spleen, hope, but most of all, despair. Again these plagues he strove in vain. For fate had poured for fate had poured a mortal oil upon his head, a disanointing poison, so that Thea, affrighted, kept her still and let him pass first onwards in among the fallen tribe, as with us mortal men, the laden heart is persecuted more and fevered more when it is nighing to the when it is nighing to the mournful house where other hearts are sick of the same bruise. So Saturn, as he walked into the midst, fell faint and would have sunk among the nest, but that he met Insulatus' ins eye. But that he met Insulatus' eye, whose mightiness... I've got to check this. I don't even know how to say that. Um... Let's see, looking it up. Enceladus. Enceladus. That's what we'll go with. But that he met Enceladus's eye, whose mightiness and awe of him at once came like an inspiration, and he shouted, Titans, behold your God, at which some groaned. Some started on their feet, some also shouted, some wept, some wailed, all bowed with reverence. And Ops, lifting her black folded veil, showed her pale cheeks and all her forehead wan, her eyebrows thin and jet and hollow eyes. There is a roaring in the bleak grown pines when winter lifts his face. There is a noise among immortals when a god gives sign with hushing finger how he might with hushing finger how he means to load his tongue with the full weight of utterless thought, with thunder and with music and with pomp. Such noise is like the roar of bleak-grown pines, which when it ceases, excuse me, which when it ceases in this mountain's world, which when it ceases in this mountain world, no other sound succeeds. But ceasing here among these fallen, Saturn's voice therefrom grew up like organ that begins anew its strain, when other harmonies stopped short, leave the dinned air vibrant leaves, leave the dinned air vibrating silvery, thus grew it up. Not in my own sad breast, which is its own great judge and searcher out, can I find, can I find reason why ye should be thus. Not in the legends of the first days. Studied from that old. Studied from that old spirit-leaved book which Tari. 
which starry Uranus with finger bright saved from the shores of darkness when the waves low ebbed still hit it up in shallow hit it up in shallow gloom and the which book ye you know I ever kept from my firm based footstool ah and firm not there nor in sign symbol or portent of element earth water air and fire at war at peace or interquarreling one against one or two or three or all each several one against the other as fire with loud as fire with air loud warring when rain floods drown both and press them both against earth's face where finding sulfur a quadruple wrath unhinges the poor world, not in that strife wherefrom I strange, not in that strife wherefrom I take strange, not in that strife wherefrom I take strange lore and read it deep. Can I find reason why you should be thus? No, no, where can unriddle, though I search and pore on nature's universal scroll, even to swooning? Why ye, divinities, the firstborn of all shaped and palpable gods, should cower beneath what in comparison is untremendous might? Yet ye are here, overwhelmed, o'erwhelmed and spurned and battered, ye are here. O Titan, shall I say, arise, ye groan, shall I say, crouch, ye groan. What can I then, O heaven wide, O unseen parent dear, what can I? Tell me, all ye brethren gods, how we can war, how engine our great wrath. O oh, speak your counsel now, for Saturn's ear is all a hungered. Thou, Oceanus, ponderest high and deep, and in thy face I see a stonied that severe content which that severe content which comes of thought and musing. Give us help. So ended Saturn. stop right there that is uh part one of hyperion and i plan to pick back up another time <laughs>